Welcome everyone to Cochrane Canada Live, the research webinar series brought to you by the Canadian Cochrane Centre. My name is Adrienne Stevens. I hope you're having a great day. I just wanted to take a moment to thank the funders of Cochrane Canada, those being the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and six of the research institutes, as well as to the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technologies and Health for your support during this funding period. Sessions like today would not be possible if it wasn't for our partnership with the Pan American Health Organization, that is the regional office of the WHO for the Americas, for them providing Illuminate Live to us to be able to produce these webinars. We thank PAHO, a valued partner of the Canadian Centre. And hot off the press, Cochrane Canada receives $9.6 million in support from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. And so we thank you, CIHR, for supporting us in this next funding period. We look forward to a productive next five years to 2015. And just to remind all of you uh, of uh, sort of our setup here within Illuminate, in particular the participants window, so where you see your name and the name of the others on this session, just below that if you want to ask a question when it comes time for questions and today's speaker will um, cue you as to when he wishes to take questions, all you need to do is simply click on this button right here to raise a hand and a cue will form here in the participant window. If you wish to send an emoticon like a happy face or, or you're not sure about something, you want to sort of send this confusion face, then you can do so during the session to let the, uh, the speaker and myself know. And a special feature of today's webinar, we're going to be doing some polling based on the data extraction exercise that was sent to you in advance. And so why don't we just try that out right now. If you're having a great day, why don't you send me a happy face. Maybe the weather's not so favorable your way and you need to send me a thumbs down. Please go ahead and do so. Oh, that's great. I'm glad you're having a great day. I just want to remind you of the format of the webinar. And so on Illuminate Live, it's set up as one audio activated at a time. And so when you wish to ask a question to uh, the speaker, you simply raise your hand. Uh, he will instruct you when it's time to ask your, uh, ask your question. And all you need to do is uh, simply click uh, here on this button that you see in the left-hand corner of your screen, ask your question. And I uh, remind you just to press that button again when you're finished asking your question and then the speaker can come on to answer it for you. And so uh, one of the things I want to do right now, just give me a moment here, is I want to bring up the uh, Cochrane Adverse Effects and Methods Group for you just online here. We can do this within Illuminate Live. And so what you should see is a web tour um, um, uh, sort of dialog box open up and you should see the website. If you're uh, joining us with a Macintosh, it will come up as a web push and open up your browser on your desktop. And so this is the Cochrane Adverse Effects Methods Group website. So if you'd like to know more about the methods group, uh, perhaps getting involved, then this is the place to go. And I will just uh, insert the active hyperlink within the chat room. And and just before you leave the session today, you can click on that and add it to your favorites. Okay, and without further ado, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Ewan Lok, and you see him here on the screen uh, in this beautiful backdrop of Leeds Castle. Ewan, thanks for sending this picture. Um, I hope one day to go there. It looks absolutely fantastic. He is a senior lecturer in clinical pharmacology at the University of East Anglia and consultant in the acute medical admissions unit at the Norfolk and Norwich University Hospital. He is co-convener of the Cochrane Adverse Effects Methods Group and has carried out several meta-analyses on the harmful effects of interventions. Currently, he is the European editor for the British Journal of Clinical Pharmacology and also serves as a member for the NHS Health Technology Assessment Pharmaceuticals Panel. And so I ask you to join me in welcoming you to the platform. Uh, Adrian, thanks for the uh, very kind uh, introduction. Uh, and um, um, I, I put a nice flattering photo with a nice backdrop, so you wouldn't uh, concentrate too hard on uh, on seeing what I uh, what I actually look like. Okay, um, so we're um, we're going to start um, with Aaron um, 
overview of what uh, what today's session is about. The first thing we're going to look at is um, what's the uh, rationale for doing systematic reviews of uh, adverse effects, G given that most systematic reviews look at benefit. The um, next thing we should consider uh, is when uh, detailed adverse effect reviews are uh, useful or, or not, as the case might be. We don't expect um, uh, detailed adverse effects assessments all the time. And one of the key questions that we uh, we often have to deal with uh, are um, do the reviews of adverse effects differ from uh, reviews of uh, benefit? And I'll point out uh, a couple of uh, areas in which they do uh, differ. And certainly, what um, what makes them different also makes them difficult. And uh, that's why we sent out a, a sheet for you to uh, to have a, a go at your own data extraction and. For this data extraction, actually, I reassure you first that is that there are no uh, there are no correct answers. I think it's open to interpretation. If you get a different answer from what I got, that's absolutely uh, fine, and that's um, that's because adverse effects are reported in uh, quite different ways as you would have seen in that uh, that example I uh, I sent you, which uh, which we got from the GlaxoSmithKline uh, trial registry. So it's uh, it's quite a difficult uh, task, um, which is why I uh, I put it up for you to practice on. Okay, so um, some of you who've looked at uh, adverse effects uh, before will uh, will see that adverse effects relies on uh, spontaneous uh, reporting uh, for for the mainstay of it, and uh, I'm sure all of you have seen case reports in journals. Uh, the WHO collects uh, case uh, reports. So what what happens here is if a, a physician or a patient uh, experiences an adverse event, then they fill in a form and they send it in. Uh, um, a researcher might write it up and send it to a journal to be published. Um, this relies on the patient or the physician picking up this warning signal, and it usually only works for new or rare, unexpected adverse events. When you feel, when you think to yourself, "Wow, that was a strange thing that happened. I better write it up and send it in to uh, uh, for somebody to look at." Now, w one of the problems with uh, with this approach is that you can't calculate the uh, the attributable rate or incidence, and the reason I say that is. Uh, for example, uh, the WHO may collect 200 reports of uh, uh, I don't know black tongue with a new drug, but they actually do not know how many people took that drug. So they know that there are 200 cases of black tongue, but nobody knows how many patients there were. So is it 200 cases in uh, in a thousand patients or 200 cases in a million patients? And that makes a, a, a lot of difference to how you perceive the adverse effect. So. Um, because of that, I I feel that it's difficult to to obtain an estimate on the precise level of risk with the uh, spontaneous reporting system. And furthermore, um, in in terms of the review process, case reports are low in the hierarchy of evidence, and they're particularly susceptible to many types of uh, bias. Uh, in particularly, um, reporting or publication bias. Uh, journals tend to publish only uh, very interesting case reports. They're not going to publish the um, the dry and boring ones. So on only specific types of adverse effects manage to get reported through this case reporting system. Now, why why have we lived with this case reporting system for such a long time? Well, actually, um, in in the past we've developed drugs which have major uh, life-saving uh, value. So imagine in the 1940s development of antibiotics for uh, pneumonia when previously there was no treatment, so the drug is life-saving. Uh, back in the 50s and 60s, people had severe hypertension that had no drug treatment available, uh, and the new drugs were uh, a valuable resource. Um, the um, in, in the past, as well, adverse uh, effects were not uh, major problems unless there was very severe uh, reactions, uh, so we didn't need high quality, uh, precise uh, estimates. Uh, I, I I see there's a question uh, of uh, of terminology which I haven't uh, gone into here, which is uh, uh, side effects, adverse effects, and adverse events. And uh, uh, for the purpose of this session, I'm just going to concentrate on. Uh, 
uh, adverse effects which we think are probably linked to the intervention. Um, whereas the uh, terminology used in other places includes adverse events, and if you use the word adverse events, it, it may be that the, uh, the event is not necessarily linked to the intervention. Uh, we, um, I won't go into side effects because we don't really use, we'll, uh, use the word side effects anymore because side effect could mean beneficial or harmful. Um, so uh, side is not specific enough for us to prefer adverse effects. Okay, um, now what, what, one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about adverse effects reviews is that it's becoming increasingly uh, important for, uh, for our clinical practice. Um, uh, in in this case, um, we're, um, we're we're dealing with many competing interventions. Uh, there's treatment uh, being used in healthy uh, people, uh, and there's treatment on non-illness. So you could have uh, a drug to treat your uh, uh, your pattern uh, baldness, or you're losing your hair. You could have a drug for that, and therefore the benefit of the treatment is not um, uh, is not completely certain. So we are, we're interested in uh, a much wider range of uh, adverse uh, e effects. Okay, so we 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 need uh, precise estimates of uh, of uh, of risk, uh, preferably from high quality data. And what what we are uh, what we're concentrating on, I think, is uh, certainly uh, one of the key things here is uh, important major certainly, and perhaps a few of the minor adverse uh, effects, which are. Uh, uh, potentially linked to um, to, to the drug uh, treatment, and it, from from there we can make a educated choice. Okay, so what what adverse effects are we uh, are we interested in? Okay, that that depends on the treatment that you are having. Certainly, in situations when there's a narrow benefit harm trade off, uh, then you'd be particularly concerned. Uh, one of the examples I've put here is that uh, aspirin in stroke patients. Now, there's clear benefit of aspirin in stroke patients, but what happens if the patient's at high risk of uh, suffering uh, adverse effects from the uh, from the drug? Uh, for instance, they have a history of GI ulcer bleeding uh, in the past, or they've just recently experienced GI ulcer bleeding. So, should this stroke patient be given aspirin? And it's a difficult decision. There are other areas where the benefit harm uh, trade off is very difficult. For instance, uh, you, uh, giving vaccines to uh, people, it prevents uh, future uh, disease, but they may be harmed by the vaccine uh, right now. So they have uh, fever and other uh, adverse effects um, from the vaccine, and that may not be acceptable to patients. Similarly, drugs to, uh, to help people stop smoking might be. Uh, I guess you stop smoking, you benefit in the next 10 or 20 years, but the drugs, uh, some of the anti-smoking drugs can cause uh, seizures, epilepsy. So um, it's important consideration. And finally, we have drugs where they, they uh, have sort of indirect benefit. Drugs for diabetes reduce the blood sugar. We're not really sure that they uh, reduce heart attacks and strokes, so there may be um, uh, debate over whether the drugs have any uh, true benefit, uh, but they may create harm for you at this point. Um, finally, I know some of you are doing reviews where there are many available treatments for a particular condition. So in, uh, in osteoarthritis, you can take a variety of painkillers. Uh, you could take a conventional non-steroidal, or you can take a cyclooxygenase 2 selective agent. Uh, which one is safer? And there's a lot of debate about that. And I, I think, um, I think Lara is here today, and uh, Lara is doing a review on different biologic agents for arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, there are lots of different biologic agents, and we don't know which one is safer. So you might uh, choose that as an area where you would like to do a review. Okay. So, uh, what's the, the what's the point of doing a review? How does it help us? Well, as you all know, the systematic review identifies a complete uh, data set and you critically appraise the available data. And in some circumstances, we get to the point where we can do a meta-analysis. And this is uh, a statistical method to combine the results uh, from separate studies. Now, this is particularly important in uh, adverse effect uh, reviews because 
single trials are powered to detect beneficial effects and often they have too small a sample size for rare adverse effects. Um, now, by doing this systematic review and meta-analysis, we can pull the data from several sources or several trials, and hopefully this gives us enough power to detect a small but important outcome difference. And, the, and from there, we can calculate the AE uh, adverse effects risk uh, more, uh, more precisely. Okay, so what's... Um, What's the limitations in reviewing adverse uh, effects data? Okay, and some of you will have already noticed, noticed this problem. Most randomized controlled trials are focused on evaluating and reporting benefit. The adverse effect is a secondary or tertiary outcome. Uh, often it is not pre-specified, it's not well defined, we don't know how they monitored it and there's little space or details available for reporting. Most of the journals spend their time, uh, manuscripts spend their time reporting the benefit and uh, they put about two or three lines on the average effect. So getting the data out is very difficult. There's a huge range of potential adverse effects and it's hard to predict or plan your review beforehand. And um, the, the reports are not very good at uh, detecting new, unexpected, or long-term adverse effects. Uh, certainly it's difficult to pick up that data. So from the trials alone, it may not be sufficient for us to, uh, to get all the information we want on, uh, on uh, important adverse effects. So um, some, uh, some reviews have used uh, non-randomized uh, studies, and I'll give you examples which I have used. Uh, a huge scare broke up about 10 years ago about diet pills and uh, heart valves and we looked at 57 randomized controlled trials. Not a single one of them had uh, cardiac echocardiograms performed routinely so they, uh, they reported no problems with heart valves but the observational studies uh, used the cardiac uh, echocardiograms and they, they scanned uh, many patients and found heart valve problems. Uh, we've done reviews on diabetes drugs and fractures and heart failure and we found that well, it's a, it's a trial in diabetes and they don't routinely measure bone mineral density so it's hard to draw a mechanism uh, behind the fractures. Uh, certainly for heart failure it's a new unexpected event there's very little data it initially cost the investigators didn't recognize it but when uh, it was after it was highlighted then a lot of uh, randomized controlled trial data later emerged. And we've got other, uh, um, other issues where uh, SSRIs and NSAIDs have an interaction causing GI bleed. There are no RCTs for that. Clopidogrel uh, and proton pump inhibitors and heart disease. There's only one RCT in the, in the review, but this was only available at a conference abstract, so we're, we're, we're not sure that we could rely on that sort of RCT, so we look for other uh, studies. So the, the message from this uh, slide is that uh, inadequate or incomplete harm data from RCTs uh, on specific adverse effects or interest. Uh, that means we uh, we end up looking for uh, for data from other uh, sources. Um, is is it worth looking uh, for for adverse effects from other sources? Well, I'll I'll give you a good reason for it uh, shortly. Now, typically, randomized controlled trials are designed to guard against type one errors of wrongly finding a benefit, and the uh, purpose is to avoid giving useless remedies to patients. I would say the opposite is often true for harm. We need to avoid being uh, pulled into a false sense of uh, security or thinking that the drug is safe when it actually isn't. And now when you're assessing uh, rare and expected adverse effects, there's a, um, there's a bias uh, in the trials which head towards the null hypothesis of there being no difference. Uh, so trials are not very good at detecting adverse events and you would therefore uh, wrongly judge the, uh, the drug to be safe just because the trial failed to detect any adverse events. Okay, so uh, what's the common scenario? For, for those of you who, uh, who look at RCTs, you will often find this sentence. It says, uh, no, significant, uh, no significant safety problems were found. Uh, and that's a very misleading uh, statement, unfortunately. Uh, the, the reason uh, for, for potential error here is, um, is that uh, the trialists did not look for or measure anything um, or uh, there weren't enough uh, patients 
the trial was too small, it didn't, uh, uh, couldn't measure a, a rare adverse event. So what you look for there is the wide 95% uh, confidence uh, intervals. The follow-up sometimes is too short. Uh, for instance, the review of diabetes ducts and fractures, which you are practicing your extraction on, uh, the trials that were less than 12 months in duration did not show any fractures, whereas at, uh, at uh, 18 months or two years or three years, there was a significant increase in fractures. So um, that's why uh, short trials are misleading and you can't draw any conclusions from it. And many trials uh, exclude patients with uh, uh, risk factors for adverse effects, so they're quite selective who they uh, enroll. The, the other danger I would like to uh, highlight is, uh, is at the bottom here where it says many many um, uh, authors slice up the adverse effects in the smaller subdivisions. So you could see uh, all reports of pneumonia and then they slice it into severe pneumonia and then they slice it further down into deaths from pneumonia. And because adverse effects are rare, when you start slicing them up, the event rate gets lower and lower and uh, perhaps there were hardly any deaths from pneumonia, but the authors were happy to write, well, no, um, there's no significant risk of uh, a death from pneumonia, which is misleading when, um, when if you look at all pneumonia, there may have been a significantly increased uh, risk. So beware of uh, subgroups uh, that have been sliced down. Okay, so given the dangers of looking at randomized controlled data, uh, how, how should we uh, decide whether to rely on it or to look at non-randomized uh, studies as well? Okay, so the pragmatic strategy that I use is that we, we do the review in the same way. So you, you have some idea what adverse effects data that you want and you look through the RCTs for the data and you check whether they have rigorous monitoring and follow-up of patients. And if you find uh, um, good evidence or important evidence for harm uh, that's, that shows a clear risk, then you may not need to look any further. However, if you detect specific concerns and the uh, risk estimates have wide 95% confidence intervals, um, or the data is incomplete, then uh, you can check uh, non-randomized uh, data. And the, the reason I say this is that the uh, non-randomized studies often the adverse effect is the primary outcome and the event has been rigorously uh, monitored, uh, ascertained and uh, followed up. So you might get um, more robust uh, data from that. Okay, so ba based on that discussion, um, I've, uh, I've put some tips here which suggest that, okay, there are lots of adverse effects, how do we start? Well, you might do a, a, a scoping mechanism first, which is sort of hypothesis generating. So you might look through case series, case reports, and see, have there been any important adverse effects rec uh, recorded with this intervention? Now, once, once you finish your scoping, you have some idea of uh, particular important adverse effects that you like to look for. Uh, and therefore, you want to test your hypothesis. Is this adverse effect definitely linked to the intervention? And if it is, what is the precise estimate of risk? And that's when you need to go to a control uh, study, um, uh, depending on this specific adverse effect. Now, randomized trials are very useful for common adverse effects that occur fairly frequently, and they are anticipated by the uh, researchers. So uh, perhaps based on a drug mechanism that you could predict that this adverse effect uh, may occur, and that's often well recorded in the uh, randomized controlled trial. When you go to a uh, new or unexpected or rare or long-term adverse effects, then um, you may need to go to a retrospective study or from RCTs that were conducted after the safety uh, concerns were uh, raised. So th this is a tip to tell you what, what sort of studies may, may uh, wh where you might get the data uh, from. Um, okay, so. Now, I just want to uh, tell you about the limitations of trying to, uh, to do this sort of uh, review. It's very hard to identify studies with the relevant adverse effects data. Even where the data is available, the, uh, the, there's a lack of detail and inconsistent uh, reporting. So the, the key questions that you, uh, you have to ask in, uh, in your review is, did the trialists look for adverse effects? And that's a very important question. Uh, and if they did, how hard did they look? How well was uh, done was the monitoring? Because if we put rubbish into our review, we'll get rubbish uh, out of it. Okay, now, uh, I'm hoping uh, that, that there will be a further webinar in the next uh, 
next few months on uh, searching for adverse effects, but I'm going to give you a, a, a brief uh, brief tips uh, on this. So obviously you know there's a free text search where you look for particular words in the title and abstract, and that's in indexing terms which are based on the cataloging process at the database pro provider. So uh, some of you may not know this, but at the uh, PubMed people, they have you know roomfuls of people sitting there who read scientific papers, and then they assign an indexing term to that uh, topic. So the indexer reads the paper, decides which key area it falls under, uh, and if if the author of the paper said that adverse effects were not significant, uh, the indexer may decide not to put in any adverse effects term. So the paper is not indexed for adverse effects. So it makes it difficult for us to search. So these, these are some of the terms that have been used in the indexing term. And uh, the, the top one, um, uh, Metline uses slash adverse effects. Uh, M-base uses a variety of terms, side effect, ever drug reaction, drug toxicity, and complications. So it's quite difficult to know uh, which one to uh, to choose. Uh, so well, when I did an aspirin uh, review, then I could type in aspirin slash adverse effects as the indexing term. Okay. So how good are these uh, specific search terms? And this is where the note of caution comes in. So we, we we had a sample set of uh, 107 trials with uh, uh, adverse effects uh, data, and we used the aspirin slash AE as a search term, and we used uh, terms such as adverse effect or side effect uh, to try and pick up all these things. So we used a broad range of adverse effects terms. Uh, and we found that almost half of them uh, didn't have the uh, MASH term indexing for adverse effects. No mention of adverse effects in title or abstract. So e even at the best uh, guess, about 23% of the uh, trials with adverse effects data fail to be retrieved with simple specific searches based on the aspirin slash AE or typing in adverse or side effect. It's, uh, it's a challenge. Uh, so often we end up manually hand searching the trials. Um, okay, so what's the other problem of using uh, free text uh, terms to uh, to search for adverse effects. Now, uh, as I mentioned, the general term is uh, is a problem, and I, uh, I and I know one of you has been querying this with me. Okay, so the authors use words like toxicity or side effect or adverse effect or adverse drug reaction or adverse event. It's really difficult. Uh, there's no standardization at the moment. Okay, so we're we're a bit stuck with that. And when you get down to a specific term. Uh, for example, you want to look for uh, tiredness. The drug, drug or intervention may cause tiredness in patients, and it's often recorded in different ways. Lethargy, tiredness, malaise, fatigue. So it's very difficult when you're trying to run that search for, um, for, for the specific adverse effect. Big problem. And uh, so you, you may not know all the terms in advance, and you have to include as many relevant synonyms as uh, possible. So finally, I'd like to say that the, the free text search does not detect adverse effects uh, if they're not mentioned in the title or abstract. Even though the adverse effect is recorded in the full report, the, um, the free text search uh, doesn't search the full report, although I know some uh, uh, more clever engines that do, PubMed, Embase, etc., they don't. They only check the title and the abstract. So you can rely on that uh, searching. So what's my, uh, what's my tip on this? Okay. Well, I do something called, uh, those of you who have access to Web of Science, there's a button that does cited reference search. And uh, it looks at what um, uh, what new papers have cited uh, a particular source. So what's the rationale for this? Adverse effects are often reported uh, in uh, case reports. So you have a new adverse effect, and uh, someone publishes a case report of this. And the pharmacoepidemiology people or uh, uh, drug safety people might do more detailed studies on it after the case report has uh, warned them of a problem. So uh, la later studies may cite this uh, uh, original report, and uh, you can find out uh, who has cited this first case report of a serious adverse effect. And you can check if a particular adverse effect has been assessed. Okay. Uh, this is quite technical. Uh, I've put a reference down there so you can uh, you can go and read it uh, 
uh, yourself. But I find it very useful to see if a particular adverse effect has been followed up and more detailed studies have been done by other people. Okay, now uh, I gave you a data extraction exercise, but I'm going to tell you how difficult uh, it is to do the data extraction exercise. And the, the, the reason I tell you it's difficult is that because there are no standardized definitions and terms. So that, that, is a, um, that is a problem. And we also don't have much information on the method that was used to detect the adverse effects. So a uh, study of adverse effects in hypertensive patients. If you rely on spontaneous reports where the patient actually comes to the doctor and complains of something, then the rate of adverse effects is 16%. If you go to the patient and say, have you experienced this specific problem, then you pick up 62%. Uh, as the rate. So the the method used to detect adverse effects, effects has a major impact on the data that you get. Okay, and they don't often report the uh, summary data according to uh, to group. And we we found this out by looking at 100, 185 RCTs of drug treatment, and we checked uh, major uh, journals to see how they reported. And we found that the the biggest problems we had was that. Um, 25 out of 185 did not mention any adverse effects at all. Uh, others failed to give the a, uh, adverse effects rates in each group, so they may have reported uh, those with the active treatment had uh, such and such a number of adverse effects, but they didn't mention how many in the control arm had it. They didn't specify the methods of monitoring, and you know we have already mentioned problems with spec uh, specification or definition, and what happens when we're trying to uh, extract data on minor ones, major ones severe ones, uh, the, the trialists didn't define what severe meant and one trial that said severe may not agree with the other trial who said uh, severe. They may have used different definitions. And only 5.8% of the space in the results and discussion uh, uh, was used for adverse effects. So there's very little space and the data is poorly, uh, um, poorly reported. So that's why uh, you will find your, uh, your exercise today quite uh, challenging. So they are challenging because of uh, lack of detail in the trial definitions and reports of adverse effects. So <coughs> makes it hard for us to compare the rates between trials. You can't assess the severity, and it's really hard to pull uh, pull the data in your meta-analysis when it's inconsistent. <coughs> okay, so um, we. Um, we're, we're going to uh, spend a few minutes on this data extraction task. I hope some of you have had the chance to uh, to look at it. I give you this task because I wanted to show you how difficult it is to uh, to uh, to look at uh, adverse effects reports um, and the challenges in making a decision on which categories uh, are relevant. And finally, how difficult it is to extract and summarize the data. <coughs> so. Um, I guess uh, we'll go on to the next slide and see. Can you uh, vote to see how, how many fractures there were in women taking rosiglitazone? <coughs> yeah, so if you look at the A, B, and C here. Uh, And uh, don't 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 worry if you um, if you get the wrong answer or whatever. There's no such thing as the wrong answer. There actually there are many answers in the for for this particular scenario. Okay, yep. Um, I see quite a, uh, I see quite a wide range of results. Uh, Adrian, yes. Mm. Okay, very, uh, very interesting. Okay. 
see. So they um, there's uh, almost equal tie between Bs and uh, Cs. Okay, so um, I think I would like to uh, I like to say what my answer was, and I I think the answer I got was uh, sixty over six hundred and forty-five. And uh, the the tricky bit about this one was that uh, I asked the question specifically about fractures in women, and uh, the 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 GSK trial summary did not tell you how many women there were in the group, um, which was really tricky. So eventually, I managed to identify the the trial publication, uh, which was in the New England Journal. And fortunately, in the, the, the trial publication, I found out uh, they gave the numbers of men. OK, so there's 811 men by subtraction. I got 60 over 645 as the answer. So it's quite tricky. <laughs> OK, so the next one is um, the number of fractures in women taking metformin. Uh, so I, I like to see some, uh, some polling answers uh, from uh, from people as to what uh, what they what they thought the uh, the answer was. So the uh, the denominator is quite easy. Um, I, I haven't put any tricks there because it says um, I think on this data sheet it clearly says thirty. So I've just put a denominator there. Okay, so we've uh, we've had a few uh, few responses. Uh, that's a little bit a uh, little bit mixed. Okay, yeah, great. Thirty over six oh five uh, seems to be uh, seems to be a majority of the answers, and that's um, that's exactly uh, that's exactly what I got as well. And that's that's the same method I. Uh, um, I subtracted the uh, the number of men from the group. So again, this is a uh, this is uh, somewhat uh, similar. So fractures in women taking in the glyburite arm. So could you please vote now? I think this is pretty straightforward. Now that you've seen the other two. Yep, that looks uh, pretty good. Pretty good con uh, pretty good consensus there. Yeah. Okay. So the, those of you who voted have uh, twenty-one or five ninety. Yeah. Very good. Okay. So um, that's uh, that's uh, that's fracture. So what what was what was the answer? Okay. Now the, this is the problem with a three-arm trial. Do, do we merge the control group or do we not? Or do we analyze it separately? And uh, this is where uh, where I say you have to justify your decision. And in this case, uh, we combine both the glyburite and metformin group on the assumption that both had similar effects on the bone. So when we added that up, we had uh, rosiglitazone 60 over 645, control 51 over 1195, and the odds ratio there is 2.30 uh, with a lower limit of 1.56. So that shows a, a significantly increased risk of fracture f fractures with rosiglitazone. And I haven't covered the the, the 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 male data review, but the male data is uh, shows that uh, that the risk um, is 1.18 odds ratio, so doesn't seem to uh, carry as much risk. In fact, it's a non-significant risk. Uh, so that's that's what we did in our uh, in our published uh, review. Okay. So what what some of you, if you had a chance to look through the data extraction sheet, you will find that. Uh, you know, there, there are lots of other fractures listed on the on the extraction sheet. For instance, uh, you can see there are hip fractures mentioned. There are uh, patella fractures. There are skull fractures, lower limb fractures. And I found this very difficult to analyze. The event rates are very low, and I can't draw any conclusion. And uh, I found that when I tried to add it all up, it didn't tally with the overall rate. So adverse effects of special interest. They put hip. Uh, two hip fractures for osteoclastic, but when I went down to the next box, it said uh, 
curious adverse events, I found uh, three hip fractures for Ozzy Goodstone. So that made me very confused. Um, and finally, uh, ankle fractures uh, listed in the serious adverse events, was that already counted in the lower limb fractures in the first part, which was adverse effects of special uh, interest. So very difficult to do the extraction. And so uh, although the journal editor asked us to provide uh, the extraction, we, uh, we struggled with, uh, uh, we struggled with, uh, with this one. Okay. So, okay. Now, uh, if any of you managed to get to a uh, heart failure, could you let me know, uh, if you would now, how many uh, patients with Rosie Glid and so on had uh, heart failure? Uh, could you work now, please? Great, okay, looking good. So three people have voted. Yep. This, this, this one is a challenge which I'll explain. Uh, it, it looks like B is um, a popular answer and uh, and that's uh, exactly what I got as well. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to justify this decision in a minute because it, it was very, very difficult. Um, uh, now I S some of you uh, who are, uh, are physicians will say, well, actually, pulmonary, pulmonary edema is heart failure as well. Uh, so should we have counted pulmonary edema with uh, rosiglitazone. And I, uh, I put this up uh, in case anyone has a question uh, 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 about this. So did, did anyone extract uh, any of these numbers for pulmonary edema? Uh, if you can, please vote now which number you got for rosiglitazone. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Um, so most, so uh, quite some uncertainty with, uh, with 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 this one. Yeah. And I'll tell you this one. I don't know the right answer actually. It's uh, it's 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 a big challenge. So what did I do? Okay. So what we did in our in the, oh gosh this this was a review we published uh, in JAMA a couple of years back, about three years back now. So in the end, it was really difficult. Uh, there were lots of heart failure terms uh, in this one. Uh, there's CHF and pulmonary edema in adverse events of special interest. When you look down the serious adverse events, there was a cardiac failure congestive, there was cardiac failure, uh, there's pulmonary edema, there's cardiac failure acute. So that's what I meant at the beginning. It's really hard to decide what to, uh, to extract for adverse effects because there's so many ways in which they are listed. So I. I took the easy way out on this one, and I extracted uh, the adverse events of special interest, which was CHF, uh, which I assume means chronic heart failure, and pulmonary edema. And I got 22 over 1456 and 28 over 2895. Now, I'm not saying this is the right answer, because you will be equally justified in, um, in choosing uh, something else to, uh, to extract. Uh, so long as you can, justify it. OK, now, this one's really hard. One of the tasks I wanted you to think about was myocardial infarction. Uh, so rosiglitazone has been linked to myocardial infarction. And if you were doing a review on rosiglitazone and you had this data sheet, which categories would you extract? So you've got A to E, MI and acute MI, or you've got all the other things, myocardial ischemia, acute coronary syndrome, all MIs, or myocardial ischemia alone, or acute coronary syndrome, or yet some other uh, plan for your extraction. So please work now and tell me what the, which category you would li have liked to extract. Yes, very uh, very interesting. So I uh, I don't need any numbers from any of you. I just want to see what the what cat category you thought might be good to extract. Okay, let's have a look at the results. I think it looks like there's lots of uh, oh, very interesting. So there are lots of uh, there are lots of A's on this one. You chose to extract MI and acute MI. Yep, very good. Okay, 
But you know, you you could justifiably argue that uh, well, acute coronary syndrome is a type of myocardial infarction as well. So, but as I said, there's no right uh, there's no right answer on this. Okay, so um, my uh, my view is that there's no clear consensus on which category to uh, extract. Some of them seem to overlap, and uh, I, I'm I'm a suspicious. Uh, suspicious uh, person and I, I wonder whether the, those with MI and acute MI, some of them are being reported twice. Um, so patients may be uh, double counted. So for the meta-analysis, we, uh, we chose the easy way out. We chose AMI plus MI, although I see that some of you have uh, chosen other as your choice and I think that would be equally uh, uh, justified. But we, uh, I suppose you could do a sensitivity analysis based on uh, the differences of categories if you want to and see if the results uh, change. So that's the figures we got at the end, 23 over 1456 and 29 over 2895. Okay, so I've taken up um, 45 minutes of your time and uh, I want to have some time at the end for uh, for questions and debate. So what I'm going to summarize uh, some of the uh, lessons from this exercise is that um, Adverse effects data can be difficult to extract, as you've seen, uh, and you need to make subjective judgments uh, when uh, when doing your review. And I know Cochrane doesn't like subjective judgments, but that's the only way we can manage it, uh, because there is no definite correct answer uh, for what the um, what the adverse effect uh, category is. In fact, there are uh, I would say many of the different answers that some of you have come up with are. Uh, entirely acceptable so long as uh, we can uh, justify this in a transparent uh, way. So what do I recommend? What, what did we learn from this exercise? Okay, well we learned that there are many different categories uh, by which adverse effects can be uh, categorized and reported and therefore uh, what I propose uh, as a sensible uh, method is to do some sort of uh, scoping exercise beforehand if if you're planning to tackle uh, specific adverse effects. Because A, it helps you identify adverse effects of specific concern. You can uh, pick up a variety of formats that the adverse effects data may be reported in. For instance, this company trial report. And you can choose study designs that are able to answer this question. And hopefully, beforehand, you have some definition of uh, the categories and adverse effects terms for your review. So uh, maybe beforehand, you have you 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 may have decided that uh, congestive heart failure and pulmonary edema are the appropriate terms, and you'd be happy with that. And this should make your data extraction process smoother and more transparent, um, and much easier to do rather than be faced with uh, with uh, with the data that I've shown you, where there are hundreds of adverse effects listed and you're struggling to uh, classify and analyze uh, them. And I think that's my last slide, so I'm going to hand over the microphone back to Adrian. Thank you, Yoon. And I just want to apologize. I forgot to change the voting uh, choices from the ABC through um, to the A through E. So I apologize. And thanks for those of you who uh, took the initiative to send uh, your D or E answers through the chat room. So at this point, why don't we open the floor to questions. If you have a question to ask, again, just click on that raised hand um, icon um, just on the bottom left underneath the participant window if you have a question at this time. Or if you're joining us without a microphone, you can use the chat room and just send your question through there. And Yoon will be happy to answer. Okay, I guess I was just sort of thinking on the spot, you and I wondered um, when you're um, doing your summary of findings table and you have an adverse event, um, can you sort of walk through how if you, I guess just sort of thinking through if you have more than just RCT data, I haven't had a chance to do one myself, how you would sort of work through grading of that? That's, that's a very valid question. We, um, we spent most of last week uh, arguing about that, unfortunately. And the consensus uh, was that, um, OK, one of the views was that we should draw a separate table for adverse effects. But uh, this uh, view wasn't widely supported, and, uh, unfortunately. So the, the current consensus we, uh, we had last week was that we should try and report it in the same summary of findings uh, 
table, but because some of the data was uh, not uh, uh, not randomized or not of such good quality, we would have to uh, uh, downgrade uh, the uh, the evidence for uh, for those things. So same same table, uh, put the outcomes there. Uh, be transparent and say that some of the data came from uh, either trials that are too small or ran non-randomized studies that were uh, you know, pretty good studies, but they were non-randomized, so we have to downgrade them. OK, so um, I'm just going to refer to the chat room. A uh, question came through me. We see the slide about the search terms for Medline and Embase again. Thanks. And I'll just hand the microphone over to Yoon, and uh, he can address that. Okay, so I've, uh, I've, I've, I've I see two such, uh, two questions coming up here. Yep. So the first thing is the slide on the uh, the indexing terms that I use on Medline and uh, M base. And typically for Medline, I use the one which has slash uh, at with the uh, effects as the uh, as the search uh, term. Okay. Now I see. Yep. I see a second question. Well. The next question I'm dealing with is, uh, what about uh, getting manufacturer's data for um, um, for adverse effects? Yet, um, now I haven't covered this, and uh, I'm, I think Adrian uh, will at some point be organizing one on data sources for adverse effects. But what what I do is that I regularly search the uh, US FDA website. The US FDA does uh, very thorough uh, reviews or drafts, and there's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of data that they submit uh, that the companies have submitted to them for marketing approval. So if you if you look for the name of your drug and for new drug approval uh, on the FDA website, then it is a very useful uh, place to find uh, unpublished data. And I regularly go there. Uh, okay. Yep. Uh, next question was adverse effects. Um, yep. And we 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 are stuck with this term is an adverse effects or adverse events or adverse drug reaction. And there is selective reporting uh, where the investigator has made a subjective judgment where the adverse effects is uh, thought to be due to the intervention. Uh, I certainly consider this uh, selective reporting, and it would certainly be much uh, better to have all adverse events. And uh, I I try and extract all adverse events as far as possible. And the reason for this is, for instance, fractures. For many years, fractures were thought not to be related to the uh, rosiglitazone, and so the investigator would have dismissed all of them if we rely on them uh, reporting thought to be due to intervention. So I agree, we need our uh, data. Uh, okay. Well, so some of you I'm glad to see would like to be involved in the adverse effects uh, methods group. So. Uh, please register on our website, and we'll be happy to uh, to uh, get in touch uh, with you. Okay, is there a poor is there a reason for poor documentation or adverse events? Uh, okay, they, uh, the short answer is that it is uh, entirely due to the researchers uh, wanting to write up an article that looks at the benefit of whatever drug they are looking at. Now, the, the data sheet I send you is from a GSK trial summary report. And actually, the adverse effects on this report are 48 pages long. I've only sent you three pages of it. So there were hundreds, uh, or should I say thousands, of adverse events recorded. But most of these are not reported in the journal. Uh, and journals actually like reports of benefit as well. So if you are able to find uh, FDA evaluation, or you can find a, a full trial report from uh, the company trial register, uh, then it's much um, much better to uh, to look at um, uh, to look at the trial reports or FDA registers. Okay, next question. Yep, if there are no adverse effects reported, uh, would you approach your authors to clarify? Yes, the, the the reporting is very misleading here. Sometimes they uh, they, they they make a statement such as no significant adverse effects. Uh, it's you know it's not it's not really clear to me. So were there uh, uh, serious adverse effects, but were not considered significant? Um, or sometimes as uh, as as we found there are 25 trials out of 185 where they didn't say anything about adverse effects at all. Does that mean that nothing happened? 
or does it mean that something happened but they didn't uh, choose to report it? Uh, so uh, in those situations, I often write to the authors and say, um, when you say no significant adverse effects, does that mean nothing occurred or something occurred but you didn't uh, report it? So I do try and clarify it with the authors. Um, okay, I'll hand back to Adrian again. Okay, I'm just wondering, there are a few other questions that came through um, and I was busy dealing with technical stuff on the side, so I just wanted to make sure you and you can let me know. There was a question about um, manufacturers are required to monitor adverse events as a condition of gaining market approval. What do you think about requesting access to these data for Cochrane reviews? Um, if you've answered that already, just send me a happy face. Maybe I'll pass. You have, okay, perfect. There was a question that had come through about um, um, do you have recommendations as to where to search for adverse events of non-regulated agents such as herbal supplements other than case reports in the literature? I'll hand back the microphone. Okay, yep, this, this, this is a big problem, uh, uh, for certainly for unregulated agents and it's not just herbal supplements that we've been struggling with there. There are lots of uh, device manufacturers actually, and the uh, things that device manufacturers don't don't have to go through the medicines regulatory a uh, process. Um, we're we're struggling with uh, with that at the the moment because there there is no good uh, register of such uh, um, adverse uh, events for herbal supplements or devices. Anything out of the mainstream is very poorly uh, reported. So. Unfortunately, I don't. Um, I don't have a good answer uh, for non-regulated uh, uh, agents uh, at the moment. I think this has to do with the, the primary literature. Uh, unless legislation is put in, uh, we uh, we we don't have good uh, studies or good collections of such uh, data. Okay, <clears throat> so I'll just uh, allow just another second if there's uh, another question or two to come through. But in the meantime, please join me in thanking Yoon for his great presentation. We appreciate your time um, and your expertise in addressing this. This is great. Um, so it doesn't look as though anything else is coming through. If you think of a question afterwards, please uh, don't hesitate to send it to us here at the Cochrane Center, ccnc-iph at uottawa.ca. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to jump ahead. Um, I'm going to send you a couple of files right now. There was a, a question about whether or not you received the slides. And what I will do is send those through to you now, as well as uh, an evaluation form t for today. We would love to hear your feedback. Um, in particular for ideas for future sessions and whether or not one on um, addressing searching for adverse effects would be uh, of, of use for you. And I'd also like to thank all of you for joining on. Thank you for participating in the poll, providing your comments and questions. Uh, it's been fantastic to have you a part of things. And so I believe this is the end of the session. And so I just want to thank you so much for joining us. And um, do be on the watch out for our next series due to start in September. You can contact us uh, again through that email if you want to be added to the uh, alert listserv. Otherwise, you can refer to our website at www.ccc.cochrane.org. And I uh, just want to thank you again for joining us. And enjoy the next few months. Have a great day.